Hello and welcome to the Cracking the Cryptic podcast. I'm Peter C. Hayward. I'm Simon Anthony. And I'm Mark Goodliffe. And this is your one-stop podcast for all things Sudoku related. Today we're going to be talking about Sudoku in a lot of detail because we are going to focus on the Sudoku solving process. Uh, My thinking here is that you two are probably uh, two of the best Sudoku solvers, I'm going to go ahead and say it. But more importantly, the two best Sudoku communicators. You have built the YouTube channel Cracking the Cryptic with its 350,000 subscribers, all about talking through how you solve a Sudoku. And so I figured uh, this is my opportunity to really interview in depth about what that looks like. It sounds like it's really adding an extra challenge to do it with audio only, though. (laughs) Yes, I'm I'm not going to not going to present you with a Sudoku to solve. Um, So. Let's, let, let's, let's talk about the very, very basics. Uh, what is a Sudoku? Let, let's just really, really, really break it down. Okay, a Sudoku is a uh, nine by nine grid in which all the rows, columns, and three by three boxes have to be filled with the numbers one to nine, and you will be given some clues like given digits in order to start the puzzle. Does Sudoku mean anything? Is that, is that a word in Japanese that has a specific meaning, do you know? It's two words from Japanese meaning number place, from what I remember. Ah, gotcha. So... Obviously, there's all kinds of levels of difficulty with Sudoku, from the very, very easy ones that you can fill in in a few minutes to some that have taken uh, some of the world's best Sudokus hours to solve. And so I just want to ask, when you when you look at a Sudoku, when you open up Sudoku and you look at it, can you can you tell? Can you immediately tell how easy or hard it's going to be to solve? No, not normally when I open Sudokus that we now solve on the channel, I assume it's going to be impossible to solve. <laughs> because there's probably no given digits there's probably gobbledygook in the grid that (laughs) you know i don't have an immediate feel for how i'm going to approach the puzzle yeah and this is this is all to do with how sudoku's moved as well in the last couple of years i think when we started cracking the cryptic and we were we were doing sudoku's on the channel we got loads of given digits and all of the constraints were sort of they were known to us a little bit and it was very rare to be honest that we'd start a video and fail to finish it now it's far more common because the puzzles have got harder and and more interesting as a result actually so it's win-win although a bit daunting i think in classic sudoku which doesn't have extra rules you can get a bit of a guide as to whether it's going to be relatively easy or not from just the number of given digits which is the only way classic sudoku can start you off but as simon says when you get to the variants that we're pretty much solving every day now. The variety and variability of the puzzles is such that it's really hard to tell if you're going to be meeting a monstrous puzzle or not. So let's talk about that. Uh, Classic Sudoku is obviously where you just get a grid and it's missing some of the numbers. So I guess the the easiest possible Classic Sudoku would be a 9 by 9 grid with all but one digit filled in and your job is to work out what that one missing digit is. True. But variants or constraints, as Simon called them, can come in all kinds of different forms. So what, what does that look like? What would you say is, is a... How, how would you describe a variant Sudoku? It would have extra markings or something. So one of the... Markings named after you, of course, after Mark Goodliffe. I wish they were. Uh, <laughs> one of the most popular forms of variant is killer Sudoku, where a number of cages appear in the grid, as well as the 3x3 three three boxes. And the cages will have the total of the numbers in that cage which adds a mathematical element to what is otherwise just a logic problem with no maths and that's about the simplest form in some ways or certainly the most well-known variant that's the one that i know that john cleese knows i had a had a meeting with john cleese last year um he he uses a website where you can pay an exorbitant amount of money to have a five-minute meeting with one of the comedy legends and so i did that and i built a bunch of sudokus for him several of which you've done on the channel and he mentioned oh i love sudoku i love killer sudokus and as someone who had never heard of a Sudoku variant before your channel, I was blown away that he knew about variant Sudokus at all. That just stunned me. And since then, I've obviously learned that killer Sudokus are quite common. Why do you think, why do you think killer Sudoku is the one that's really taken off outside of normal Sudoku? I don't know. I don't know. Here in England, the Times followed up Sudoku, which proved incredibly popular with killer Sudoku as the first variant they tried. And it caught on as well. I mean, you know, I think they then began to believe that any variant they published would be popular, but that didn't work out quite so well. Oh, really? Which ones did they try? <laughs> um, I can't remember. <laughs> they, think... went, they went straight into the most complex ones on the channel. <laughs> they're like, they're like killer. They must love, you know, miracle thermo killer hybrids. <laughs> I can't remember if they tried Windoku, which is slightly more complicated to understand. 
I'm not sure. What do they call that? They they do sam they do samurai as well, don't they? The samurai, which is oh, they do do samurai, which which again hasn't really caught on worldwide. Samurai involves uh, basically bolting five Sudoku puzzles together at the corners. So um, they you effectively get I can't even do the calculation, but many more three by three boxes to fill in. It's basically um, five puzzles sort of stuck together and uh, <laughs> it obviously takes a lot longer. I was gonna say it's, it's just Sudoku but more so. <laughs> People don't want that, mu that many minutes taken out of their day normally so it didn't really catch on. And you mentioned Windoku as well, uh, is that something you can describe in podcast form? This is, this is really the challenge, I'm just gonna keep throwing visual stuff at you. <laughs> Windoku involves a regular Sudoku grid but with four three by three areas all one cell away from the edge that also contain the digits one to nine. So if you picture it as four windows on a classic child's house, those are what the cages look like. And in our last podcast, we asked for listener questions. And I think the question we got the most is simply, do you two have a favorite variant? Is there a type of Sudoku variant that you love above all others? Not me. Um, I, I, I love the variety. I mean, always, it, it's just fascinating to try different types. I quite like mixing up the variants together. We, we discourage people who mix up six or seven variants because it takes a long time to present the rules on the channel and it's very complicated, but they do make for well, when you mix up two or three variants, it can make for very interesting challenges and patterns that you're not expecting, which is really pleasant. Simon, have you got a favorite? Well, I'm going to answer that question in an annoying way by saying I have, I do have, <laughs> I do have Sudokus that I'm less keen on. It's only very slightly less keen on, but for example, the miracle constraint, I think that that's almost run its course now. Whereas I like Killer, I like Arrows, I like Thermos less because I'm worse at them. So if you look at the way that Mark and I solve thermos, we actually approach the solve very differently. And my way is far, far less precise, and <laughs> rather more random. And as a result of that, I've had some yeah, bad experiences in, in terms of solving on the channel with thermos. So I tend to <laughs> ward myself off them a bit more. You've, you've been burned ironically by thermometers. Yeah, ironically, yes. <laughs> De definitely one's preferences are shaped by what you're good at. And I'm terrible, for instance, at skyscraper Sudoku, which involves visualizing all the cells in the grid as buildings of a certain height and seeing how many you can see from the given directions. Skyscrapers are easier if you go to the top of a skyscraper and solve them. There's something about the, the air density, it just, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but if you have uh, vertigo, that doesn't work so well. <laughs> uh, so yeah, that's, that's an interesting question. What, what variant of Sudoku would you say you are best at? Killer Sudoku for me, I would say. Um, one of the weird things about, weird things, this is gonna sound insulting. One of the weird things about your weird channel of weird Sudoku solving is just seeing you keep all the numbers in your head. When I first started watching, I would try some of the Sudokus, especially Thermos, but anytime you solved a killer, I would just be like, nope, I'm not, I'm not touching that because as you're solving it, you're sitting there going like, okay, this is a 27 cage, which obviously means it contains a three and a seven or something. And I'm sitting there being like, cause he just, eaten a calculator has he memorized a textbook like how are you able to keep all of those numbers in your head a lot of it is experience a lot of it is just having seen 27 cages in four cells so many times that you know you know what the numbers are there is a there is a pattern to them you know if you count down from the top sudoku number you can go well it's either 9873 and then you can replace 73 by the numbers inside them and it could be 9864 or you could go 9765 and that's it. Suddenly you've run out of possibilities. And learning those combinations is a mixture between virtually learning the combinations sometimes, but also just knowing how close to the maximum and minimum they are. <laughs> do you sit there and do drills? <laughs> no, not at all, no. Just flashcards, you've got your, your spouse holding up, you know, <laughs> 14 cage in five, go. I mean, that one would be a challenge, but. Uh... I think that's one of the real appeals of Sudoku is that there's no kind of shortcut that way. It annoys me about competitive Scrabble, which I think I would be good at if it wasn't for the fact that the experts learn lists of words. And <laughs> yeah, you have to memorize, literally spend a lot of time memorizing what combinations work. I, you know, that doesn't appeal so much. Uh, I, saw, I think I saw in the Discord someone mentioned that uh, Simon has a triangle number rule or something like that for killer cages. <laughs> yeah, so this is something that I sometimes use to work out, for example, you know, whether 
a cage of five digits, which has a total of 19, for example, whether that must have a one or a two in it. You're looking blank, Peter. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, was hope, I was hoping there'd be more of an explanation than just I have a technique. <laughs> well, yeah. So, so what I what I've learned is that the triangle triangular number for six, for example, is twenty one. So I just know that one plus two plus three plus four plus five plus six is twenty one. So I know if I miss out a one from a five cell cage, then the other digits would add up to twenty at a minimum. So I can use that to try and take the logic further. Triangle numbers are something I experienced through uh, game design. Triangle numbers are very, very big when you're designing a board game of all things, because it's a way of making a set increase in value as you collect more. So a, a triangle number is, you know, if you have one of something, it's one, two, it's three, because you've added two onto it. Uh, why are they called triangle numbers? I'm, I'm trying to I'm trying to work out why that you, you mentioned a confused look on my face. That's what it is. <laughs> it's like a snooker table or a pool table. You know, that if you set up the triangle, you know, you've got a sort of. Oh yes, yeah. yes. It's not a triangle of numbers. It's a triangle, and you count them. So yeah, if, yeah. if you have uh, one on top and then two underneath, that makes a triangle. And yeah. Then three underneath that, that's a triangle. And so those are the triangle numbers, and, the, and they are one, three, six, ten, fifteen, twenty-one. Any game designer can do this. We all have the triangle numbers <laughs> memorized. Right. And so similarly, if, if you're trying to solve killer Sudokus, it's useful because you can work out what were you saying if there has to be a one in it. Yeah. So, so if you know if 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 you had a total of nineteen, you could then deduce that you would have to have certain digits in that cage. And so killer cages are yeah, they're, they're such an interesting variant. When I when I was first watching the channel, I would avoid those. And then when I started setting, I didn't know what else to set because you guys solve so many killer Sudokus. So I started setting killer Sudokus that only have added up to 10 because I could keep those numbers in my head. So my first puzzle that was ever on the channel was hang 10, Mark solved it. And it's 10 cages, each of them adds up to a different number between one and 10. And that's because I just couldn't keep a 28 cage straight in my head, just couldn't make sense of it. Uh, <laughs> since then actually setting Sudokus has taught me how to solve killer Sudokus. It's weird, every time I need to learn a new type of Sudoku, I just try to set it. And putting it together lets you learn how it works in its own distinct way. So if you are struggling with various types of Sudoku, try setting one. It's a really interesting way of learning how to solve them. Yeah, Demono said, gave us a setting video recently, and one of his big pieces of advice was, if you want to become better at solving Sudokus, set Sudokus. If you want to become better at setting Sudokus, solve more Sudokus. <laughs> Absolutely. For the Cracking the Cryptic book, Cracking the Cryptic's Greatest Hits, which is going to the printer in the next few days as of time of recording, one of these puzzles I set for the puzzle hunt is a skyscraper. And I had never solved a skyscraper before setting that. And now that I've set it, I'm like, oh, I can solve these relatively easily. Like you, you really, you internalize how it all works. But let's say someone doesn't want to set Sudokus and uh, they want to learn how to solve it. When you're looking to solve a Sudoku, I know Simon, you've said in a few videos that you're looking for a weak point. Mm -hmm. So what what is what is that? It's such an interesting phrase. What is a weak point while solving a Sudoku? Gosh, that's difficult to describe as well. It's it's a feeling that you get about where the puzzle is giving more information than the average cell. So if you're looking at regions of a Sudoku, for example, in a classic Sudoku, if you imagine that there were very few given digits in a box and very few di given digits in the rows and columns that were affecting that box, that would be probably not the place to start because it's it's got quite a lot of defense if you like there's quite a lot of optionality in that box whereas if on the other hand you have a row or column that's got five or six given digits and maybe you know in that box you might have another digit that doesn't appear in that row or column that's starting to feel like a weaker point a point where you can attack it because the options are limited and the huge challenge obviously is that when you have variant sudoku and you're trying to juggle the extra constraints which might be cages or thermometers or arrows or knife moves trying to get a feel for where the weak point is then is i want to say it's luck i suppose it's not perhaps luck but it's it's a lot harder it's a lot harder it's intuition rather than yeah if, yeah i think it's a combination of knowledge and experience particularly you you mm -hmm. today yes. is a, a puzzle of elimination and you <laughs> get to learn what are the things that eliminate the most options fairly quickly and so you're looking for something that yeah it's weak and weakness is restriction as well. They're sort of synonymous in this context. If it's very restricted, then it's weak because you can 
attack it. This is a very violent way of solving a Sudoku. <laughs> One of the most placid activities you can do, but we're like, yes, now the way to destroy it, to crush it beneath your heel. Yeah, but that's, that's if you ever watch um, any of the chess YouTubing, you know, and you listen to the commentary on chess, it's very much gauged in sort of military terms and, you know, <laughs> things of strong defences, weak defences, attacking, defending. It's, uh, I think it's, it's quite natural to take that to Sudoku. It's not obviously you're not competing against a person in Sudoku, but you you are in a way you you know you're sort of it's you against the constructor. One of the things I've had to change for the channel is my um, me against violent the... tendencies. <laughs> well, my my tendency to race the clock and just get the Sudoku done in any way, no matter how it happens, as long as it's fast. <laughs> Because that misses some of the, you know, that, that leads me to bifurcate, which people hate, and uh, avoids the logical path. And the logic often has some beauty in it, which shouldn't be just ignored. Whereas, you know, my, my, my goal for many years was just to get through puzzles as quickly as I possibly could without necessarily trying to appreciate them all the way. <laughs> you, you, you enjoyed not enjoying it. <laughs> I, I didn't mind. <laughs> <laughs> so okay that, that's an interesting angle um what why do you enjoy solving a sudoku it's the challenge somebody's put a puzzle in the newspaper or on the channel or sent it to you and there's an element of them saying let's see if you can solve this and that's a challenge I, I, that's what it makes me want to have a go yeah but it's it's i think it's much more nuanced than that in a way though because like if i saw a mild sudoku in a newspaper I would have literally no interest in solving it like none is that because it's not presenting a challenge though yeah and it's i wouldn't feel like i got got one up on the world by solving it whereas if it's a hard puzzle you sort of you feel like you know you're elevating yourself a bit by managing to solve it so it's definitely to do with you know the inherent challenge that i think that is there's an element of one-upmanship i agree with that but but for a mild puzzle in a paper, I can still find a challenge in solving it as fast as I can. Oh, I so couldn't. if I can dash oh. it off, then 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 that's that's achieved my little degree of one upmanship. <laughs> so this might be a bit obvious, but are you two competitive people? Yeah, very, very, very competitive. More so. <laughs> <laughs> It's so interesting because I, I work in board games and I play a lot of board games and I now solve Sudokus and yet I'm 0% competitive. I'm just, really? I, I don't I don't mind if I win. For me, it, it is about the beauty of it. And this is what I, and I think a lot of people get from the channel is not see, like seeing you guys be victorious uh, to continue with the violent <laughs> imagery, mm -hmm. to, to see you guys, you know, strangle the Sudoku until the life drains out of it is obviously very satisfying just because seeing someone win is satisfying. But the real appeal of the channel and the real appeal of Sudokus for me and even board games is about that the beauty of the journey that Simon was talking about in the first episode, that elegance and the, the sheer wonder of the solve path rather than just whether or not you win it. And I think this is why a lot of people would love to see mm -hmm the videos where you don't succeed which sounds so strange and i know this is horrible to you guys you're like you want to see us fail you want to see us you want to see the, you know the sudoku standing over our dead body with a bloody knife in its hand but it's not necessarily about the winning for a lot of people yeah but the, the, the difficulty for me in that and you have to you have to bear in mind our last comments which is that we are very competitive people and every video we make is frankly an opportunity for the world to laugh at how stupid we are <laughs> and many of the comments take delight in you know in the fact that we've we've been slow or you know been a bit dumb sometimes and you've missed the nine in the box staring you in the face Absolutely. yeah and actually you know i find it quite difficult to read those comments because it you'd feel them you really do you, you know because i'm a competitive person and i don't oh, wow. i don't want people to think i'm daft I look at the comment and go, oh my goodness me, how I, I, you know, I just want to go and cry in a hole, basically. And la now imagine that if it was a puzzle that we'd failed to solve or I'd failed to solve. And the comment, the comments, there would be some nice people <laughs> who would say, oh, well, you know, this one got the better of you. But there would be 10,000 comments saying, ha ha ha, I managed to do it and you couldn't. And that would be, you know, I'd have to, you know. I'd have to retire for a while, I think. <laughs> <laughs> the other thing about puzzles that we fail to solve, and I'm speaking largely for myself, but it's probably true for Simon, is that 
in fact, the video is just not, it's not, oh, well, that's beaten me. You know, I, I am the bloody victim sitting under the corpse. It, no, it's a long bit of the commentary sort of drains away as you just can't find anything else to say. Then there's a long pause. <laughs> it's just 40 minutes of you sobbing. <laughs> and you sit there and you go, well, I'll, I'll have one more think about this and see if I can resuscitate it. And then you just go, no. And, and you know, I turn off the video. And what, what's interesting to watch about long pauses? Not much. <laughs> do, do your spouses then have to comfort you? I mean, it, it would... <laughs> do you go into the other room and they just hold you to their breast? And they're like, there, there. It's okay. you, you'll beat the next line. I believe in you. No, it's fine. Because you can get some joy back by immediately sending it to the other person with, you'll enjoy this puzzle. <laughs> It's funny, if, if you think of it like a sports team, what you guys have essentially done is uh, you're, you're a sports team, it's, you know, the Solvers versus Sudokus, except you only ever broadcast the, 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 the games where your team wins. <laughs> the games where your team losses, nothing, <laughs> never appear. Mm -hmm. For the proper Sudoku constructor, though, they are trying to, to create a battle that they will lose. Yeah. That's what a proper Sudoku constructor is trying to do. It may be a tough battle, it may be a long battle, but they don't want to win it. Because if they create a puzzle that you don't solve, nobody gets much satisfaction out of that. Or I hope not. They are, they are, you're playing to win. The solver is the showman. They're, they're, they're not, they're not playing to win. They're playing to put on the best possible show and, you know, get defeated in, in a beautiful way. The, the, the constructor. Yeah, that's right. Yes, I'm sorry. The, the setter. Yeah. Uh, so you mentioned solve path. Uh, let, let's just, just find some terms here. What, what is a solve path? What does that mean? It's the path you take through the puzzle, solving it as you go. So, I mean, that's literally <laughs> what it is. However, for a really <laughs> tightly constructed puzzle, and I'm using odd terms that I'll effectively define, um, there is a linear solve path where you have to follow the one line of deductions to get to the right conclusion. And the more tightly constructed a puzzle is, the more linear the solve path, Generally, the harder it is because you have to find exactly those steps all along the way. You can't get distracted because other things just won't get you there. And, and that's considered better constructed. That's considered more, more beautiful. Usually. I mean, I'm not, I'm not a massive fan of linear solve paths because if I can't find them, I don't look great. Yes, I think so. I, I prefer to see things that you can come at at different angles and, and find different ways. <laughs> he couldn't disagree more. No. Oh, I couldn't. Oh, I'm going to disagree with Mark. I couldn't disagree with you more, <laughs> to borrow a phrase from a, a BBC radio comedy. Um, <laughs> no, I think that, I mean, a lot of the language of Sudoku now is around the words breaking. You know, constructors are trying to devise cleverer and cleverer break-ins to the puzzle. And this means that basically the puzzle is impervious to anything other than the particular line of logic. And the solver's job is to find that particular weak point. And, you know, that's that's fantastic. Uh, and it's I, I get a lot of satisfaction. Obviously, it's not satisfying if you can't find the break in. But if you can, it's lovely. And then you start to appreciate just how clever these setters are because they and you're one of them, Peter, because even <laughs> once you've got the break in, you don't want the puzzle to then just collapse. So the, the break in has to lead somewhere, you know, you've got to keep the path through the forest rather than you've just sort of come out into an open field and you can go off in any direction you want you know it's it's very kind of you say that because i was about to say the exact opposite <laughs> my, my, my faulty towers puzzle is a really good example of it's got a very clever cool break in and then once you break in it just solves <laughs> the entire thing just immediately collapses uh because it, it was a that was one of the first good puzzles I actually set. And yes, I, didn't, yeah. I didn't understand that there was <laughs> setting beyond the break-in. So I made a break-in. I was like, well, once I found that, they're done, right? That's the point of the puzzle. So I just basically gave you the rest of the answers. So if you watch that video, it's interesting. You spend about 15, 20 minutes trying to find the first digit. And then once you do, it's like five minutes to solve the rest of the puzzle. Uh, and nowadays, I'm, I'm better at, at having the path go through the forest, as you said. But definitely in my early days, I was like, break-in done, puzzle is set. That's it. <laughs> that's all you have to do yeah again that's one of the ways puzzles have developed um he i think a lot of people have done that when they've begun setting they found an interesting <laughs> break in and that's that's the beauty of the puzzle you know and they don't really care that much after that then of course some of the setters found that 
it was quite interesting watching us still struggle by chance with some of the puzzles. And if they could make that keep going, it was even better. There are, I, 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 could, I could list several of them, I won't for the sake of the listener, but there are several puzzles where you, you, you break in and then you break in again and then you break in again and then you break in again and down to maybe the last 10 digits, which from a blank grid of, of 81 is remarkable. Still like getting those last few digits in, it, it's incredible. Yeah. I couldn't agree more. Yeah, I, th- I think when we first found puzzles where the last 10 or 12 digits were hard, we were just like, hang on, there's something wrong. What, what am I missing here? This must be easy at this point, but it doesn't happen. And it's quite, a, yeah. And that's one of the beauties of the form, that you keep finding these new things. And it's quite an interesting thought experiment, you know, to, 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 to think about some of these puzzles and then try and imagine how you would go about creating that. Because I think we can sort of understand, or, you know, I've set enough Sudoku to sort of understand how to create a break-in. But then to protect the break-in and continue the path through the forest without breaking the break-in, because that's the other thing. Yeah. As you introduce more things into the puzzle, your potential to ruin what you've already created increases. You know, it's like, you know, you've built a Fabergé egg and then you've just... It, it's the bane of a setter. Yeah. <laughs> you, you, you add a yeah. digit in to, to, you know, disambiguate something at the very end and then you start solving mm-hmm. the puzzle again and you're like, oh, well, that completely shortcuts my first five things that I, I set for this puzzle. It's miserable. Mm-hmm. Sorry, uh, keep, keep going yeah. with what you're saying about a Fabergé egg. Well, no, and, and then, you know, so you've, you've almost built the perfect Fabergé egg and you just realise that you've just got to put this piece in the top here. But in putting that piece in, you've effect- you've effectively graffitied over the whole thing because it's no longer it's no longer a Fabergé egg. It's uh, uh, something rather <laughs> less beautiful and not quite what you had in your mind. So yeah, my respect for some of the setting achievements that are going on you know, on the Sudoku scene at the moment is is massive. It really is. It's interesting because so we we call Sudoku's puzzles. You know, pen and paper puzzle. Puzzle is the term and. I think it's almost in the definition of a puzzle that has one answer. And when you're, when you're solving a puzzle, it's about finding that one answer. I mean, to use Jigsaw Puzzle as an example, it's about finding exactly the one way they fit together and nothing else. So a really uh, limited or restricted break-in or a really beautiful puzzle feels like you're solving a Jigsaw Puzzle. A really, a really beautiful Sudoku feels like you're solving a Jigsaw Puzzle in that you have to find those two pieces that go together. And once you do, you can start to see the picture. It's, it's a really fascinating craft, honestly. Um, Mark, you mentioned bifurcation earlier. Do you want to answer the most controversial question in all of Sudoku? What is bifurcation? Well, bifurca- well and it's a very hard and uh, shaded question <laughs> to answer, in my opinion. I'm lob- lobbing you the easy balls. <laughs> bifurcation is the following of one path in a Sudoku without a logical reason to have chosen it, in order that you can find whether it either A, solves the whole puzzle, or B, breaks the puzzle so that you can come back and unwind it and start again with the other option. It was, I think, early on in Sudoku, it may even still be in the Wikipedia article, it was described as Ariadne's thread, like Theseus in the the (laughs) labyrinth. He was putting down a thread to follow it and see if it worked, and he could come back along it if not. It's something that people don't like because, for for the very reasonable reason that it is not following logic, it's just making a choice and seeing what then happens. Brute forcing the pieces of the puzzle to fit together. Exactly. But there is an argument, and we occasionally see it on the channel when somebody complains that some move looked like bifurcation to them. Somebody else will sometimes respond with what I think is quite an intelligent observation that any single um, piece of logic in a Sudoku is a form of bifurcation because even if you put a two in the last cell in the puzzle, you're saying, what can't go in there? Well, it can't be a 1, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, or 9. So it must be a 2. That's effectively it. We follow our own standards. My, my own personal view of bifurcation is, if I can see it in my head in the puzzle, then I don't think I'm bifurcating. Because even some of the most elegant break-ins that, that Simon loves... And he's a, he's a hater of bifurcation. Let me tell you, he just despises it. But even some of the more extensive um, and clever break-ins, they involve seeing three or four things in the puzzle together. And it's a form of bifurcation in a way, but it's such a mild form that, you know, every solver has to draw their own line over, or viewer even, has to draw their line over what they think is bifurcation. And mine is probably a fairly generous one because... 
I can juggle some numbers in my head and see a distance ahead. <laughs> so I know that with some puzzle break-ins you'll be watching, and the, the break-in will almost be bifurcation. And it, it's, such, it's such an interesting area because you're like, well, you know, you can narrow down a mostly empty grid to one of two things. How, how far along that is still bifurcation if it's part of the break-in? I don't know, I feel like the, the definition gets a little blurry the earlier in the puzzle it happens. <laughs> yeah, and you've got to allow me really to make the case for the anti-bifurcation lobby because <laughs> um, <Go ahead. laughs> you know, I abhor bifurcation and you know I think um, I think to be fair to Mark the one about can you visualize it I have got sympathy for I think if you can visualize it if you can look at the grid and say in your mind if this then that then that then that that breaks that's just about okay what I really abhor is I'm at a point in a puzzle. I don't know what to do. I'll just guess this square. I'll put in all the results of that guess. Oh, it broke six cells later, which I couldn't foresee. And therefore, I just click unwind on the computer until I get back to that point, choose the other digit and go forward from there. And, and that, that's true bifurcation. That, that's, that's what most people think of when you say bifurcation. Yeah, that's true bifurcation. It's, it's a method a lot of people use for solving. And part of my, I suppose, prejudice against it is because I never did it when I was competing <laughs> in Sudoku. I, you know, I would all, I would never, I would never do that. I would just sit, literally sit there waiting for inspiration to strike while everyone else was <laughs> finishing around me. Um, because, you know, I, it just never occurred to me that that was really a valid method. Whereas it's obviously a valid method and in speed solving, it's essential that you get good at it. Simon came back from a world championship, uh, a world Sudoku championship before I'd ever been to one. And he told me he'd watched the final of the Sudoku part. And uh, he was so disappointed because he'd realized that every single top solver in the world was prepared to bifurcate and in some cases, immediately. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, and that's... And he was, he was so distressed that he just thought the whole art yeah. was ruined. It's, it's go going to a wrestling match and noticing that the very top level, they all have guns <laughs> that they just pull out and shoot their opponents. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and you're like, well, hang on, this, I thought we were wrestling here. What's happening? And, you know, to, to be fair, the, let's be honest as well, the, the very top of the world in terms of sudoku the speed at which they can compute and see digits is is it's beyond normal comprehension so um so if you can if if you're prepared to bifurcate and you can still solve this you know any amount of the sudoku that's left in 45 seconds because you're that quick then it's a very valid strategy um and you know it's it is definitely a skill um but it <laughs> there's a puzzle oh, no it's just i just think it sort of takes all of the romance out of it and i'm also certain that if if this if our channel had resolved you know if we'd started off saying I've got to this point not sure what to do i'll just have a guess <laughs> you know, i don't think it would have become popular at all <laughs> I always think back to a video that you guys made, um, possibly even bef before the, the channel really exploded um, after the Miracle Sudoku. It was it was not a Sudoku. It was another pen and paper puzzle. And for my sins, I can't remember. Maybe a castle wall. Is that a type of pen and paper puzzle? Yeah, that's it. Uh, and it was yes, specifically it. designed for world championships to be bifurcation. Proof. Yeah. It was incredible. Because yeah. I... Back in the day when, uh, when when I first started watching it, I tried to solve every puzzle that you guys did that wasn't a killer cage. That was my rule. If it wasn't a killer cage puzzle, I would sit down and try to solve it every day. And so I sat down with that one. I probably spent all of that day and half the next just trying to break this one puzzle. And I eventually got it. I was really proud of myself. Um, but it, it absolutely, you couldn't bifurcate it. it. It couldn't be done. And it was just such incredible construction. Uh, it was. I think that puzzle's by Ken Endo, if I remember rightly, who is a yes, yes, world puzzle right. champion and, you know, just a genius. Um, but that, I thought, was the quintessential puzzle that should have appeared in the World Puzzle Championship final. <laughs> That's what they should have been presented with because it was, it wasn't quite immune, but it was virtually immune to bifurcation. And you'd have found who was the best logical solver because they would have had to sit there, even if it took 25 minutes, and worked it out. And that, for me, would have been marvellous. But 
I think for a lot of people it would have been a step too far. And, uh, you know, I think, yeah, m my view of what's acceptable in terms of, you know, being susceptible to bifurcation is, is probably an outlier. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's interesting that that moment that Mark was describing, where you came home, you know, your oh. eyes dead, your 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 hands shaking, and just you know, they they all bifurcated, they all did it. Oh, it's incredibly depressing as well. I mean, it's depressing anyway when you go when you go to the World Championship and you're sort of my standard, because you know I'm okay at solving Sudoku, but the speed of the top some would say you're pretty the, good at it the, the speed the <laughs> speed of the top people is three hundred and fifty thousand people <laughs> might say you do okay i don't know yeah no but the speed of the top people it has to be seen to be believed to be honest so it, it's depressing from that perspective but then then when you realize that they you know that they they're just more efficient than you are and they have better strategies to get the puzzles done quickly that's that's also a bit depressing that's probably the reason I really like Killer Sudoku because I remember at that probably at the World Championship Mark's talking about they had a a Killer Sudoku they had a team round where the Killer Sudoku was in pieces there were jigsaw pieces with different bits of Killer Sudoku on them and you had to assemble it and solve the Killer Sudoku <laughs> and I could do that that was absolutely fine because I'm quite you know reasonably numerate and it made sense to me um, so I, you know, have a really good memory of that puzzle. Um, whereas sort of solving classic Sudoku in one minute, five seconds or whatever it is you have to do on average to be competitive. Whoa, that's just, it's just not something that is my metier. What I was going to say is that feeling when you came back from the, from the, uh, championship, I feel like everyone in every industry experiences that at some point. Uh, one, one of my close friends, we were driving home from a board game convention and he's a designer and he'd been trying to get a game signed and he just played the hit game of the year and he was like but it's 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 not very good it's just it's just <laughs> pretty and we were all like yeah it, it sold well not because it's the most beautifully elegantly crafted board game but because it's marketable and it's a good product and he's like but it's but it's not it's it, it, that same feeling of like but i i thought this industry was this one thing and now it turns out it's something like just directly adjacent i think that's a universal experience have you guys this is a very weird question that i could only ask you to have you experienced that as accountants <laughs> oh yeah i i have is, is, is there an, is there an accountancy championship no there's well there might be an accountancy champ sorry i'll shut up in a minute but i just just use you know but that i just use this analogy which is that i spent a long time in my life becoming relatively decent at accounting and and then you met mark and you were like oh that's all you have to do jeez <laughs> no i wasn't gonna no no this is the other way around that's quite interesting um, <laughs> and i was looking at the accounts for uh, a company that i was very familiar with and i realized that the what i was looking at could be could be saying any number of things and there was no way for me despite sort of I suppose a deep expertise in the subject to know which was the true position and I just I just sort of felt good grief this is just a total waste of time um, and that there is a great big hole in this whole you know the whole logical structure that underpins <laughs> accountancy and um, you know the production of accounts and they have to be uh, true and fair and understandable to the reader and actually the more sophisticated you are and the more sophisticated games you can play with accounting you you start to realize good grief who who really understands this because if i didn't understand what i was looking at i simply don't believe that all these analysts out there could understand it and therefore why would the share price go up or down if you don't know what you're what you're looking at if people with a deep expertise can't understand it how do you form conclusions that result in the movement of money as a result of it, it it's yeah, it became rather depressing was, was that the day that your love of accountancy died oh that, that died a long time ago <laughs> <laughs> so and that's the point of my epiphany, which was equally depressing. I had qualified as a chartered accountant. I was quite pleased with that. It wasn't easy exams. And uh, then a few years later, I met Simon, and it turned out he was a chartered accountant as well. Now, in my firm, 
of maybe 70 or 80 qualified accountants in the group in my firm, one person had once won a prize in one subject. And this is a prize awarded nationally to the people who, you know, so they would be in the top three people who had sat one of those accountancy exams that year, and they'd won a prize for it. Um, and that, she, she was renowned in our firm as the person who won the prize. I'm talking to Simon. He goes, oh, yeah, I won a few prizes. And I went, what do you mean, a few? <laughs> yeah, he'd won a prize in almost every subject and an overall one. And he hadn't listened in any of the lectures. He had just read the stuff first, understood it all. Uh, He's a totally natural accountant, <laughs> and yet he was depressed by this. No, this is this is this is slightly through rose-tinted <laughs> spectacles. I, I do I do remember. Well, it's yeah, you can't deny the facts in there. <laughs> I do remember in the first set of exams that we had at wherever it was. I did I did do very well, yeah. and I do remember that they they sent me home for the the final exam so I basically said look I'm I, I'd rather go and play golf and just de-stress and they said that's fine but we don't want you in the classroom you're just a disruption so I <laughs> and this is a perfect segue to my next story which is that in the same conversation he mentioned that he played golf as I did and uh, I asked what's your handicap and I'd met people who had handicaps in the single figures and been very impressed by their golf. <laughs> people who were eight or nine. He goes two, and like, like so, virtually professional. Okay. And this is the thing with Simon: everything he bothers to try at, he gets brilliant at. It's really painful. No, that's but that's not true either. Because I get I get to a point at all these things, but then it's like my I'm capped out. And that's what's so depressing. <laughs> I reach these these points. That... He's capped out at a virtually maximum level. <laughs> yeah, but I can't ever. I can't ever become really properly good at anything. You're only second best in the world. What's even the point in trying? Jeez. That that is literally what he would think. There is no yeah. question at all. No question yeah. at all. And the thing he hates about me the most is that I have yeah. won prizes at crosswords <laughs> and even Sudoku. Yeah, no, it's, it's infuriating. It's absolutely infuriating because, you know, he, you know, when he's telling his, you know, his grandchildren the story of his life, he will be able to say, you know, I actually, you know, I was the great cryptic crossword solver that ever was. And I'll be able to say, yeah, I was all right at golf. <laughs> you know, I did a bit of Sudoku. I, you know, I played a bit of bridge. You know, <laughs> you know, I'll just be a series of mediocre things, which you know, without ever being. Your standard of mediocre is very different to anyone else's standard of mediocre. <laughs> it's 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 unbelievable. His standard of mediocre is frightening. It's funny. Uh, I, I can't remember his name. The guy who writes Dilbert. He kind of went off the deep end. But before he went off the deep end. Scott, Scott Adams. Adams. He had a blog yeah. that I used to love, and in one he talked about if if you're if you can't be the best in the world at something, be top ninety percent in two <laughs> things and combine them. So, you guys have <laughs> by far the top Sudoku channel in the world. Like, and this this is the most downloaded Sudoku po podcast of all time. And believe me, I checked because I wanted to put my name. I wanted to put that on my resume. And so Scott Adams said, like, I can't draw very well. I'm kind of funny, but by combining these two 90% skills, he made Dilbert, which did pretty well for itself. So uh, all you need to do, Simon, is combine Sudoku, golf, accounting, and guitar, and then... Whew. And that's what, that's what he's done, apart from the golf, now with the channel. <laughs> then, then I might be the best. Yeah. <laughs> so after, uh, after you guys are done with Sudoku, you're going to switch the, the channel over to like analyze, analyzing the accountancy? <laughs> one, of, one of the ideas for a business that Simon had before the Sudoku channel was analyzing golf divots. What's, what's a divot? It's the lump of earth you take out of the ground when you hit a good golf shot. And Simon wanted to... Wait, hey, you like to take it home and put it on your mantle? Or... <laughs> no, no, he was going to look at the footage, the footage of, what the, of the piece of ground you'd taken out and analyse what was wrong with people's golf swing. Oh, oh take out accidentally. <laughs> <laughs> well, not accidentally. It's actually part of a proper shot. Yeah, but the shape of the divot tells you so much about 
the, the shot and the, the swing of the person who's made the shot. The, <laughs> but but if you go if you go to YouTube and look up you know golf technique dissecting the divot. <laughs> Yeah, there's there's very very little on divot analysis, and so I think this yeah. was one of the uh, business ideas I had to disabuse him of being likely to succeed. Yeah, that would that would have been massive, but I was I was talked out of it. I, I was gonna I'm gonna take you on the journey that I went on. I thought you were saying after a particularly good golf shot, people will come in with a shovel and just you know take the lump of earth to like commemorate what a good golf shot, what what a good swing it was, and I was like. And then you want to take that one step further and start <laughs> analysing the Earth and being like, ah, oh, yes, there was half an earthworm in this. That's what made it such a good swing. Uh, you two mentioned that uh, you've, you've been to the World Championships and most people's exposure to you will be from the, watching the YouTube channel where you, you two are far and away the best solvers I've ever seen and the best that most people have ever seen. So how much of a gulf is there between you two and, and the world's best? I think Sam Kaplan lines is he, is he England's best solver or...? or... I know, I know there's a few setters who also uh, solve at a professional at a, at a high level. Um, Sam and David McNeil would be Britain's best two, I think. Uh, Tom Collier's not far behind. They're they're three very good solvers, um, but even they stand back when they're watching somebody like um, Ken Endo. Well, no, uh, maybe, well, yes, a bit. Well, no, it's uh, yes, a bit. Actually, he did very well this year, uh, but also Teet Vung, Tan Tan Dai. Um, Kota, Kota Morinishi, they're just we we can't understand what they're doing in the same way that when you first watch us, if you've not really done more than a classic Sudoku, you can't understand what we're doing. We cannot see yeah. how they can be doing things that quickly, and the the gulf is the gulf is as big between a casual solver and us as it is between us and them. In my view, yeah, there is. Yeah, there's no, there's no way practice could make up the difference. It's, it's simply talent that is not even really understandable. You, you know, I, I don't know whether it's the f they can read more quickly or that they can calculate more quickly or some combination of those things. It's very hard. I don't know if you've ever seen the film Rain Man. It's a bit like that. You know, when he drops the sticks, and he. He says, you know, there's 273 or however many. Yeah. He can just see it. He can just see the answer. And that's, it's almost like watching that. They just seem to be able to see everything. And that we did a video with Tan Tan, didn't we? Where Yeah, we did. And even Bastian, uh, Bastian Vargem, who's one of the world's very best solvers, you know, even he was impressed at the speed at which... So I, I don't mean to correct you. I think it's Bastian Vile Jamie. Just a little embarrassing <laughs> that you got his name. So, <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so yeah, I mean, even you know, even Bastian was looking at that sort of thinking. Goodness me, this is this is remarkably fast. I mean, if you watch that video, it's quite extraordinary. Even as you know, even as Mark, Mark's faster than I am. Um, you know, Mark watching that. I mean, he can tell you it's it's. It's like watching a different species, to be honest. It's just... Yeah, it re I'm totally in sync with that. It really is incredible watching her do that. And she was using a platform, a, a software platform she's not used to. I mean, it's just mind-blowing what she did, mm. in, even in that video. And that wasn't her at her best. Um, the, the only glimpse I get of, of what they're doing is... People sometimes think I'm quite good at spotting naked singles, which is a Sudoku term for... Uh... <laughs> Enough about your personal life, Mark. Let, let's get back to... <laughs> he's, he's, out, hees outstanding in his private life, yeah. There you go. <laughs> I'm using it in this sense, as I sell in a puzzle which can see all eight other possibilities so that you know which one digit it is. And... Um, what people don't really understand is that I am constantly cycling through the digits one to nine in my head. Kind of, if I can see nine, four, seven, five, three in a row, I know one, two, six, eight are missing. And if I can see the one, six, eight in, a, in the column as well, it's easy. I know that's a two. And people are going, how did you ever spot that that cell was important? And it's more from just constantly cycling through the one to nine digits row after row after row after row um, <laughs> and I can do that with 1 to 9 this is why you will never see us doing a 1 to 12 or 1 to 16 Sudoku because it just isn't possible that's too much for me oh but the other 
I the puzzle the puzzle hunter mentioned earlier the last one that was a, a skyscraper was a one to ten Sudoku and Mark you wrote back to me and you were like that one was quite difficult and I was thinking it like I, I don't think it was really that much more difficult but th this explains at least where that where that perception came from that, that's part of it but yeah. also I think your brain is weird I mean one one to ten Mark, I, can I think manage. Mark's brain is weird because <laughs> when he scans and says what's missing from a row or column he doesn't do it in order. So he'll say, oh, there's one, two, eight, six missing. You know, even though he should just go one, two, six, eight. Surely, surely he's cycling, yeah. you know, surely he's counting upwards in his brain. Whereas he doesn't seem to... He, he's doing it alphabetically. <laughs> uh, maybe. He's definitely not doing it in any normal way, which goes... People have complained in the way. comments, please could Mark say the digits in order when he's doing that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just deliberately obtuse. Well, do, do, do you know why you do that, Mark? Like, do you have any any idea? I don't need them to be in order. Madness. It doesn't matter. I can I can think of the nine digits in any order and know that they're nine different ones. Ah, oh, so when when you're cycling them in your head, you're not literally like cycling one through nine. You're just cycling. No, I don't have to start from one. Not at all. But it's not even starting from one. If if it's something like one two eight six, it's it's. No, if the first thing I see in the row is an eight, okay. I'm starting from eight. Oh, that's so interesting. Yeah, I'm I'm not a good solver. I'll, I'll be perfectly honest. I'm much much better setter than I'm a solver. And I'll never be I'll never be a speed solver because I can't scan. I just I can't do it. I have to sit there and say one two three four five six seven eight nine. Not not out loud, fortunately, but. Uh, close enough to and when, I, when I'm solving a thermo I, I good lift it I have to have all the digits there to see it no. and more than that like if, if I'm stuck in a Sudoku I will fill in every cell with every digit that I know is there because I I can't keep like I'll, I'll never be a good solver because I literally just can't keep it in my head it's one of the things I most admire when you know when, when Mark's out watching naked singles and he comes home and solves <laughs> Sudoku it's really interesting to uh, to see him just be like oh that one's missing so this is a very weird question. I understand if you can't answer it, but do you know how you two do that? Like, how do you keep it all in your head? I don't know how. I mean, just, again, experience and, and doing a lot of it. I can't, I've got yeah. no better answer than that. Yeah, because I do think, if we think back, Mark, to when we first saw Sudoku, and if you were to compare Mark Goodliffe then to Mark Goodliffe now, I think Mark Goodliffe then would be quite impressed with the solver that Mark Goodliffe now has become. No doubt at all. No doubt at yeah. all. Yeah. So, it's, you know, it's all I think it is definitely. experience that the amount of knowledge that we have. But but having said that, just to, you know, just to reiterate, no amount of experience will make either of us Kotamoinishi or Tantan die. It wouldn't, you know, yeah. we just don't have whatever it is in terms of the synapses. To <laughs> and I presume what they've got is all the bits of ability that we have, like Simon's ability to spot weak points in difficult break-ins, my ability to cycle through the digits in your head quickly. You know, they've got all of those and more things going on for them. Just, just so, turned up to 11. Yeah, exactly. And we yeah. don't even know what that what the extra stuff is. So, you know, we can only give you a slight sidelight into That's their world. Drugs. <laughs> <laughs> have, have either of you two read The Player of Games by Ian M. Banks? I have. A wonderful book, I, yes. I, I just read that the other week. And it's, uh, mm -hmm. it, it's a story of a man who is... It, it's a sci-fi set in a space opera kind of universe and he's the best game player in the universe and he's played all of the different board games it, it's a world with no video games which is beautiful <laughs> as someone who designed board games I, I was very pleased pleased by that mm -hmm. and so he's played every game he's played all of the like things that are like chess he's played all the things that are like risk he's played all the things that are like every type of board game you can imagine and he's brought to a planet uh, where the entire civilization not, not even a planet a, a system where the entire civilization is based around the most complex game ever made and because he knows all the little bits of different games, he's able to like combine them and, and become very good at that game as well. And so it's just funny listening to you two. Like, if, if you were to break down the elements of Sudoku, there's obviously scanning, which is looking for what's what's there and what's not. And then there's there's sort of this other aspect, which is the I, I, I'm I'm a writer, but I don't have words for it. It's like seeing the whole thing click together. <laughs> um, and I, I want to say this is probably Simon's strength. He can he can look at a look at a grid and just it's sort of like seeing the weak point, but it's seeing how all these different vectors intersect to create those weak points. That's exactly right. I think that's what he's mm -hmm. doing extremely well. I mean, I, the interesting thing about a difficult puzzle that we'll do on the channel, which has a, two or three rule sets combined, is you eventually, every solver of that puzzle will have to see it holistically in a complete way with all those bits together. 
and work out how that leads to the deductions that get you through. And the speed of getting to that point where you can see it all combined is, is I think, what, what Simon's you know, special talent is, if you like. I, I get there, but I get there a bit more slowly than he does, the more complicated the puzzle setup is. As a mediocre solver, I'm very good at that side. It's the scanning that lets me down. I will often break into a puzzle after hours. I'm not fast at it. And then get to the end and be like, oh, I have three sixes in this column. That's, <laughs> that's not going to work. Um, and, and often I'll just be like, okay, I'm just going to go watch the video because I can't be bothered <laughs> rewinding to the point where I put a six in, in, in the same column as another six or something like that. But the uh... Well, the scanning lets us all down just to different degrees. <laughs> <laughs> scanning is everyone's weakness. Um, okay, we do need to wrap up. I want to ask one more question about solving, which is uh, you mentioned earlier, Mark, that in one of the championships, one of these world's greatest sol solvers was using a program they weren't familiar with. How important is the software? So, so you guys obviously have your own custom software that uses uh, Snyder notation. Do you want to quickly describe what Snyder notation is? Yeah, well, you described earlier that you fill in all the candidates in cells that you're still trying to fill in in the puzzle. Um, Snyder notation is a way of using pencil marks. Punishing people who do that, <laughs> saying no. <laughs> in, well, it's, it's a quicker way of using pencil marks where you identify where a digit can be within a box particularly and you notate it into the corner of each cell that it can be which would normally only be two if it's worth marking um, and that means that you're limiting where a digit can be in a box to a couple of cells and that can be very helpful with combined with something else you can see in the puzzle so if, if they're both in the same column you know that it can't be in any other squares in that column boxes in that column that's what snyder notation is i mean Intriguingly, I think, I, I basically developed my own form of Snyder notation long before Simon went to the World Championship. He then came back having spoken to Thomas Snyder and found out that this was how he pencil marked puzzles. And Simon was fascinated and showed it to me. And I was like, well, I'm already doing something quite <laughs> like that myself. So isn't that what everyone's doing? And he kind of <laughs> found out that there are, there are different ways to pencil mark puzzles. So some people have written to us and said, you know, obviously I have pencil marked every possible digit in this puzzle. Um, what is the next step? And we just look at their grid and go, <laughs> we would never look at a grid in that form at yeah. all. So it's very hard for us to know. Uh, and so you're, you're, the software that you use on the Kraken Cryptic is, is built around Snyder notation, um, which is not named after Principal Snyder from Buffy. I was most disappointed to learn. <laughs> and do you, do you, obviously that allows stuff like coloring and uh, undoing and things like that. Do you ever solve on paper anymore? Is, is that a thing that you still do in your life? I don't, actually. Um, Mark, you can probably do more. Yeah, I do a bit. I, I do a certain amount of solving on paper, and I'm perfectly happy solving on paper. I actually, until... I'm, I'm going to say two years ago, I never believed that there would be a software interface that I would be happy solving on. And then Sam Kappelman Lines sent this to us to use. And, you, you know, it, the reason that it's good for Snyder pencil marks is you can put pencil marks both in a corner and in the centre. So you can use the two different systems of pencil marks together. And it's such a wonderful solving tool that, um, yeah, I, I never thought I'd get to the stage where there would be an easier way to solve than on paper. But that is now the best way, particularly because when I make a mistake, which happens more and more often these days, <laughs> I can unwind it back to the position where it was right. And that's just glorious. You know, you have to be very selective with your pencil and rubber if you're doing that on paper. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And actually, you know, with the, the standard of puzzles now where colouring is becoming more and more essential, um, being it would be very hard to solve the puzzles that we're doing, I think, with paper and pencil now yeah um, so yeah it's 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 an interesting time and the software is getting better and better as well as we have um sven neumann's been sort of developing what sam built and i think <laughs> we can now draw we can draw loops in the grid and things like that which opens up a whole new <laughs> uh, avenue for puzzles a world of possibilities it's yeah. a wonderful time um any other any other last comments that you want to make on on solving a sudoku Obviously, you have literally thousands of hours of <laughs> footage of exactly this topic, but... Uh... No, just uh, if you are listening to this and you never have, I don't know quite why you're listening to this, but do give it a, do, <laughs> but do give it a go. You might be surprised. Um, the, the only other thing I'll add is that when um, a friend of mine who knew that I 
uh, solve Sudoku competitively. You know, he asked to see me solve one, and uh, he watched. You know, and with the right amount of impressedness as I finished the puzzle and he then goes what did you write at the top and I wrote well I wrote down my time he goes why <laughs> I don't know I just always start the stopwatch write down my time I just do it uh is is there a particular Sudoku you can think of that you would recommend if someone's never done a Sudoku and they've somehow ended up an hour into a, the second episode of a Sudoku solving podcast is is there a list of recommendations that you have or is there a good starting point Obviously, just go back to the first video and watch all of them in order. But once you've done that... Well, probably don't do that. Probably uh, <laughs> find, find a, a more recent one. Well, you, 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 can't, you can't, can't start with the recent ones because they're overwhelming. Yeah. They're just terrifying. No, but well, find a more recent one but, that's, that's less than 20 minutes long. And that'll be an interesting puzzle. Yeah, or find, find one of the ones we did on the channel way back in the day which was a, was a classic Sudoku by somebody called Okuyama, uh, <laughs> who is a Japanese constructor. And I think if you have been used to solving Sudoku in a newspaper, and perhaps you might be bored of that, um, and might be wondering what, all, <laughs> you know, what we're talking about here, solve a classic Sudoku by Okuyama, and then you'll start to appreciate the difference between computer generated and handcrafted puzzles simon simon had a nikolai book uh, which had okuyama puzzles in it and he'd solved two or three of them and he he rang me up and said listen if we're going to do this channel we have to get in touch with this guy and i'm going you don't speak japanese you don't know anybody <laughs> who's in the nikolai organization he goes i'm going to find a way and he did <laughs> and i did and I did. I thought you were going to say you don't speak Japanese, or, or you do speak Japanese. You'd be like, no, I'm not the world's best Japanese speaker. So it's essentially like I don't speak it. That's plausible. Um, I, I have bad news for you too. That was in fact a, a, a test, and you both failed. The correct answer was go look at Peter's Sudoku's and find the ones that, that have rated one. one or two stars. Uh, very disappointed, both of you. Sorry. So that is all for the second episode of the Crack and Cryptic podcast. I hope you've enjoyed. One thing I forgot to mention last time is that the theme music for this was played by Lucy Audrin. She did a magnificent cover of the standard Crack and Cryptic theme music. So thank you so much for that, Lucy. If you enjoy the podcast, leave a comment or email podcast at crackingthecryptic.com with any questions you'd like me to ask on the show. We'll be back in a few weeks with another episode, this time about the Sudoku convention circuit. This episode was sponsored by Night Crew, which is my comedy sci-fi podcast that stars, among other people, Simon Anthony. The voice cast for this show is amazing. We have the voice of Tommy Pickles, the voice of Jimmy Neutron. We have Pro ZD and Jenny Nicholson. You can listen to the whole thing at nightcrewpodcast.com and click through and check out the Kickstarter we've got running right now to try and make a whole first season. And we're going to end with a small sample from Night Crew. Hope you enjoy. The call is coming from outside the ship, ma'am. Hello? Hello? Dial four for outside lines, ma'am. This is Erikosh, the Spider Queen. You have interrupted my royal slumber, a crime punishable by marriage. Marriage? They're black widows, ma'am. We are gathered here today to join this spaceship and spider in holy matrimony. No! Queen Arakosh, as the officer in charge of this vessel, I demand that you stop the wedding immediately. Mm, no. That didn't work, ma'am. I know, Aston. By the power vested in me, by me, I hereby pronounce us ship and wife. I may now eat the groom. Where's my ladle? For the record, ma'am, I did warn you that this was a bad idea. <sighs> Please hold. Gravy, gravy, gravy. Oh no, that's the gravy alarm. We need to tell the captain before this becomes an incident. We can't ask for help, Aston. This is all part of the test.